a very good morning to all of you welcome to another episode of sri knowledge academy weekly sunday webinar series today we have a very interesting topic obstructive sleep apnea before moving on to the lecture uh, let's go to see some housekeeping rules the webinar link will be open for you to join in from 9 9 to 9 and no late you have to stay until the end of the lecture to claim the cpd points and obtain the e certificate kindly keep your mics and videos turned off during the lecture if you have any questions you can type it in the chat box you can ask the at the end of the lecture directly from the lecturer the link for to obtain the e certificate will be posted in the chat box at the end of the lecture okay now let's go to today's topic it is dr bimanta perera consultant ent surgeon unity university hospital kdu where her dr bimanta perera graduated from manipal university uh, medical uh, manipal college of medical sciences in 2005 and completed his post graduate training in otorhino laryngology and head and neck surgery in 2017 he was an international fellow at bobic hospital nhs trust and also worked as a consultant ent surgeon at the university hospital birmingham his special interest are rhinology skull based surgery vertigo and obstructive sleep apnea related surgery he has multiple local and international publications in peer reviewed journals and co author of several chapters he is currently the co editor of sri lanka sljol and council member of council member also he is also a member of ent uk and the british rhinology society and an international fellow of the american college of laryngology dear sir over to you to conduct my lecture uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, kind introduction okay, let me try and start sharing my so thank you very much and good morning everyone um, sorry to keep you up on a sunday morning but, but i hope i will not put you all to sleep <laughs> a uh, topic that is related to topic osa because i think it is a, a highly underrated uh, subject that we don't really talk about and uh, the scope we do in sri lanka is very very little compared to what uh, it is practiced uh, in other countries so i thought as uh, all doctors we should know something about osa and also to tell what uh, the Uh, ENT surgeons' perspective is because you will realize that this is a much more multidisciplinary team effort uh, at the end of the possibilities we have uh, for our patients. Just look at this picture. I think it gives a very clear picture of how we have evolved from being primates to uh, more healthy workers. you doing manual labor and uh, eventually ending up eating all the lovely food and that's going to be the future of us if we don't stop doing this right so so a sleep disorder so it can be a variety of problems it just can be snoring it can be insomnia it can be sleep paralysis sleep apnea so there are almost 27 disorders of, uh, related to sleep so we are just talking of only one today okay and uh, however that's a very common cause of sleep disorders so what is the spectrum we have we call this sleep disorder breathing where it can start from quiet breathing to severe osa hmm? where you probably just have only intermittent snoring sometimes it's heavy snoring then we call something as upper airway resistance syndrome then comes obstructive sleep apnea or which can be mild moderate or severe so who is is this problem is it your problem no it is the spouse's problem okay or the partner family partner's problem because you're obviously fast asleep 
you will snow to your heart's content no one will know but your wife your next door neighbor or your children in the the joining rooms will probably be the ones affected so what is this mechanism of uh, obstructive sleep apnea so when we fall asleep basically what happens is we go into uh, different stages of sleep non rem rem sleep and basically what happens is all your muscles tend to get very relaxed now when you relax certain soft tissue components in your body tend to fall uh, uh with gravity okay and even the hard tissue like the bones also get relaxed the jaws may open the tongue falls back the soft palate starts uh, touching the posterior pharyngeal wall all these things basically start obstructing your normal airway so basically you breathe from your nose and you exhale from your nose but if the soft palate goes and hits the posterior pharyngeal wall uh then basically there is no breathing now this is going to be a little issue okay because once the uh, nasal airway stops automatically the mouth opens up but now what happens is when you're really, really relaxed is the tongue also falls back and um, when the tongue falls back now there is no absolutely no way the air can go up or down so this actually causes a hypoxic state and the hypoxic state is picked up by your lungs the chemoreceptors and this in turn sends a message to your brain telling get this man up otherwise we are going to die so this is sudden jolt and the patient kind of wakes up or it is in deep sleep comes to more light sleep and then the muscle tone returns back he starts breathing again and this cycle keeps on continuing and continuing the entire night okay so basically this is what happens it causes an increased intrathoracic pressure that causes recurrent micro rousals and leading high uh, to sporadic hypoxemia this leads to secondary disease manifestations okay and then eventually have end points like arrhythmias heart failures strokes renal problems uh, diabetes hypertension you name it we have it okay so as you can see now i think we need to address the elephant in the room okay i'm sure all of you all have seen these can all this right just imagine all these associated with osa now this is we don't talk about osa but we always talk about how to give how to treat hypertension we talk about how to treat diabetes okay but uh, the root cause of it do we talk quite often i don't think so that is what is my main uh, aim at this lecture is create awareness that you know there is something known as osa which can lead to all these and if we avoid osa early actually we can prevent all this to a certain extent okay so even psychologically osa is associated with uh, depression and uh, uh, all psychological problems sleep apnea also affects other organs in the body so you know, we were talking about the brain so dementia is highly associated with sleep apnea and i think these days dementia is a big topic okay stroke is an end result but apart from that you can have uh, kidney problems loss of vision sexual problems uh, bone loss and heart disease so heart disease again big talk because uh, myocardial infarction is another end point of obstructive sleep apnea okay so this is why you really need to get some treatment and this could potentially save your life right so now as clinicians when patients come and say about snoring these are few things we can uh, you know have in our back of our minds to suspect that this patient has osa okay 
So if they have loud snoring, that can be heard throughout the house. Very common, at least in Colombo, of course, we get patients who even tell them, I'll never get the cut data at the hand on. Okay. But uh, coughing, choking, gasping for air during sleep. So this is sometimes the spouse comes and tells the patient, just gets up and opens the mouth, takes a deep breath and goes back to sleep. Very common thing. Then dry mouth, sore throat in the morning, excessive daytime sleepiness, important, we will discuss that later. Uh, difficult in concentrating during the day and feeling exhausted. Now, let's talk about snoring. I'm sure more, many of us have had this experience of snoring at least one point in our life. Okay. So it can be occasional, it can be after alcohol can be habitual or it can be even heroic. And uh, what we need to know is, is, is this simple snoring or is it actually obstructive sleep apnea? Because if it is only snoring, as I told you, the soft palate only vibrates and makes the noise. As long as it vibrates and makes the noise, we really don't care. As long as it does not obstruct. Okay. And then basically snoring. So... Uh, Snoring can be occasional after alcohol, habitual or heroic. And what we need to know is, is this simple snoring or not? Okay. Because if it is snoring, it's just that the soft palate is vibrating and that really doesn't uh, cause us concern. However, if it is obstructive sleep apnea, we have to really do something about it. Uh, and we need to know if this is a central cause or obstructive cause. Okay. Because central cause... We as ENT surgeons will not touch. This will go uh, to be dealt with the respiratory physicians and the neurologists. Okay. So uh, what's important is diagnosing. So before diagnosing, we need to know the, where is the anatomical obstruction and what's the physiological severity. Okay. So uh, for the clinicians, this is basically the history. Um, where we uh, take history at night, what happens at night and what happens at day. I think we've discussed almost all of this with the fitness apnea, waking or choking, with un unrefreshed sleep, nocturnal enuresis, important thing, dry mouth, okay, and decreased libido. And early morning headaches, fatigue during the daytime, and daytime sleepiness, very important. Actually, there is a score which we... I will be showing in the next few slides, uh, which I'm sure even you all, all of you all can do it now to see where you all stand. Okay. Depression is also an important thing. So we need to, they need to be treated by other specialities. Okay? So examination, we generally do a general examination, blood pressure for both the upper limbs, do a complete examination, ENT examination, okay, and then do a very specific examination of the airway. So uh, this is why we do get a lot of referrals from uh, physicians or chest physicians in regards to this to make sure that the ENT aspect of it is um, okay, no, that can cause this. Okay? As you can see, we have something known as the nasal valve. Can you see my pointer there? Yeah. So this opening of the nasal valve, when breathing in, it can close, right? So then probably all you just need to do is fix that problem. They can have a deviated septum. Then we need to fix those. These are all correctable things. Turbinate hypertrophy. Medication can help. Adenoids, okay, in children, Commonest cause for obstructive sleep apnea is adenoids and tonsils. If that's the case, just need to remove that and, uh, or treat it with medication. And then nasal polyps. So we have to rule out these problems. But apart from that, when we are doing our examination, we see for the craniofacial anatomy as well. See for retrognathia. So uh, is there a high arch palate? If there is a TMJ dislocation, okay? Is there a large tongue? Are the tonsils big? These are basic things which could give you a hint that there is an obstruction. Okay. Uh, we also, we need to see pedental malocclusions and bruxism as well. 
and uh, obviously the nasal things I've told about nasal deviation, polyps, and so on. Okay, so tonsils are a very important thing, and I'll tell you why because um, this has surgical implications. So uh, we do grade the sizes of our tonsils from okay, one to uh, four, and we also uh, see the position of our tongue while the tongue is inside and how much of the tonsils we can see with the tongue, okay? It's a little different to your malampati, uh, which the, uh, the anesthetists would be very familiar with, okay? And then we come for a uh, Friedman clinical staging, which a little too much uh, for the general medical profession, but I would just uh, outline it to you that this is what we use. Uh, this is also based on the BMI, the tonsil size, and the Friedman tongue palate position. Okay. Then, after we have examined the patient, we generally give them a questionnaire. Okay. This is called the effort cpness score. We do have this in Sinhalese as well, uh, translated and validated at the moment. Uh, but uh, we ask the patients a few questions and we tell them to answer from zero to three and then we take a scoring based on that okay so i'm sure uh, these are very valid questions where whether you fall asleep uh, what's your percentage of falling asleep basically when you're sitting and reading something watching tv sitting inactive in a public place as a passenger in a car for an hour without a break sitting and talking to someone, sitting quietly after lunch without alcohol, or if you're driving in a car while stopping for a few minutes in the traffic, the simple questions like this. And uh, then based on the questions, we can assess whether this patient has a uh, very big problem in daytime somnolence or not. Okay? Then comes the site of obstruction. How do we identify the site of obstruction? So any GP, any doctor can actually see the oral cavity, the nose, and get an idea. However, uh, for a more detailed evaluation, we generally do an endoscopy, okay, where we do something known as a Muller's maneuver, okay, uh, and then we do something known as a DICE or a drug-induced sleep endoscopy, and I'll show you the de uh, details of it. Uh, nowadays, we also can do cephalometry and MRI. MRIs are not performed in Sri Lanka for sleep because it, it entails that the patient should come to uh, the hospital, sleep in the MRI machine. Okay, Falling asleep in an MRI machine, as you know, uh, almost impossible in our setting. Okay? Uh, but that is the best. That is the gold standard in testing. Right. So, this we have to think, especially in our Sri Lankan subjects, what is the main cause of this problem? Okay. Is it a global problem? Is the patient really obese? Now, that is what we generally see in foreigners. So most of the research papers are published in the West. So they have a lot of these problems. But we have more local pathology. Our people are not very fat. Our people are not very obese. But they may have large tonsils, as you can see, or a large tongue. Right? So that's where we have to evaluate this hard and soft component. That means the, uh, basically the bony structures and the soft tissue structures. Right? So why? There is something known as a static and dynamic obstruction. So the static obstructions are always present, like a deviated septum, an adenoid, a tonsil, which is large, a turbinate hypertrophy. Okay? Now, these, if these are there, we have to treat them, okay? Because as you know, everyone knows that the gold standard of treatment for OSA is a CPAP machine. However, if you have these problems, CPAP is not really going to help. So, this is why we want to send this message across to everyone, telling that, you know, don't just give CPAPs to patients with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, because if they have these blocks, obstructions, they first need to be treated, okay? Now, the dynamic obstructions happen only when the patient is asleep. 
when due to the muscle tone reduction. So this is something difficult to identify, like the soft palate falling, the tongue falling. That is where we come for something known as the dice. So this is something known as a contain and content model, which we uh, used to explain. Okay. So uh, if you just see the squares, you can understand the basic uh, con basic concept where in a normal person, you put the squares in that hole there, right? There's a certain pattern where the center hole doesn't get closed. But however, in obesity, the soft tissue is more. The bony enclosure is also not too bad, okay? But in adults, they are, I mean, in, especially in the foreigners, they're a little big. So they still have a compressed uh, airway site. However, in our people, we have a very small maxilla and mandible. So even if you have the normal tissue, it is obstructed. That is the problem we have to deal with our Sri Lankan, South Indian, Chinese uh, populations. Okay. So another thing we obviously see is facial profile and see for the maxillary prognathism retro, uh, and retronathism. Okay. We get the dental... Uh, people's help for various uh, malocclusions as well, right? So one scopic thing we do is the Muller's Maneuver. That is an end basic endoscope. If anyone who is in the ENT will know that, it's just passing through the nose and then we tell the patient to close the mouth and close the nose. We will pinch the nose, they will close the mouth and inhale up. That negative pressure will cause a collapse and that gives us a general idea, okay? It's good to see the structures and the pattern of the uh, collapse of the velum or the soft palate, but not really the hyperparies, okay? So the next step we go ahead is we ask for a sleep study. Now you can see I have obviously skipped that uh, thing of dice, which I'm going to come later. So the next step we do is we either send to the respiratory physician or we request for a sleep study. So there are different types of sleep studies, level one, two, three, and four. Okay. Basic is the level four where you just do pulse oximetry. Okay. But uh, we prefer something a little more advanced. Right? At least type three. Ideally, it's a type one, which is expensive and may not be practical in our Sri Lankan setting for all the patients. Okay. Uh, However, there are government hospitals which have the facility. Uh, so based on the sleep study, only we diagnose whether the patient has obstructive sleep apnea. And we call this as obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. Okay. So there, that's where we come to a definition of apnea where there is a complete seconds during sleep. And hypopnea is something that is cut. So uh, uh, AHI is the most important thing, at least uh, on paper, right, uh, for diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea. So all our treatment is based on this, okay? Mild, moderate, or severe, OSA. That's where the apnea hypopnea index, that means the patient... Uh, stops breathing more than five times per hour and less than 15 times per hour. Okay, That's mild. If it's obviously, more than 15 to 30 per hour, that's moderate. And if he stops more than 30 times per hour, uh, that is severe. So that's every two minutes. That's sometimes it goes up to about 60. That means the patient stops breathing every minute uh, when they're sleeping, which is absolutely terrible. Okay. So then we come and do something known as a drug-induced sleep endoscopy to actually see where the level of obstruction is in a more physiological way. How we do it is we put the patient, we bring the patient to theater and uh, bring the patient to theater and uh, this is heavily based on the anesthetist. We tell the anesthetist to give a very small dose of propofol and 
start putting the patient to sleep. Then when, once he starts snoring, we obviously monitor, ideally with a bis monitoring to know where, what's the level of depth of uh, anesthesia. But uh, uh, once he starts snoring, we put a small endoscopy and see the soft palate collapsing, the uh, oropharynx collapsing, the tongue base collapsing, and the epiglottis collapsing. Okay, And then we mark it accordingly to see uh, where the problem is. And then we also observe what sort of a collapse. Is it a concentric collapse? Is it a lateral collapse? Is it an anterior posterior collapse? Because each type has its uh, implications, right? So this is just a picture to show how it looks like when everything is collapsed in the soft palate, okay? Just behind the nose, okay? And this is when it's open, right? So we see the tongue base or so the high collapse or a low collapse. Is there a lot of lymphoid hypertrophy or is it a muscular hypertrophy, okay? And if we have this monitoring, which we don't have in our country, uh, if we have this monitoring, we actually can see uh, whether this collapsibility is mainly during the REM sleep or not. Okay. And then we also see for the epiglottis because sometimes everything can be normal, but the epiglottis only falls and flaps and closes. So these patients, you just can't give a CPAP. Okay. They need a surgery. It's rare, but they need surgery. Um, and this is how we grade uh, dynamic upper airway obstruction. I don't know if it's clear, the video. Okay, see how it's collapsing on a lateral aspect in the oropharynx and the patient is snoring. This is just a video of how we do it. When the patient is snoring, we pass the scope behind the nose to see, can, as you can see, the entire lateral wall is collapsed. Okay? And it's causing a more concentric collapse. What's important here is for each different type of collapse, we can actually do a different type of surgery. Okay, And that's an apneic episode. See, now he's not breathing at all. Okay, So I'm, I'm going to skip that because it's a long slide. You can see the tongue base almost collapsing. Okay, so this doesn't happen in everyone. Okay, so we need to identify who has it and who doesn't. Right. right. Next, we can do some cephalometric X-rays. Something the OMF surgeons are very and dental surgeons are very familiar about, and we have borrowed it from them actually. And uh, we have done a few studies, that, uh, uh, but we find the benefits we can take. Uh, so potential. Uh, area of interest for people who like to do some research. Okay. So now, how do I come to a decision making on how to treat this patient? Okay. So I told you a lot of things we do, but then at the end of the day, we have to decide how to treat this patient. Okay. So it's very important that we have to see the anatomical evaluation. Okay. So just because the patient has obstructive sleep apnea and you do a sleep study and confirm that it's severe, you should not go for the CPAP. You should send the patient for an anatomical evaluation. And then, because there can be skeletal obstruction or soft tissue or even both. Okay? Is it likely a single level or a multi-level? It can be only the nose, which is easily surgically corrected. Okay? And uh, can we get away with a simple office procedure? Because as you know, uh, CPAP machine is about uh, 450 to 500,000 rupees. So how many patients can afford this? We don't have this from the government sector. Okay. So then we should start our treatment. First is obesity management. You can tell the patient to sleep on the side. Sometimes if that is okay, 
that's it tell to uh, tie a pillow to the back and sleep okay you don't need any surgery you don't need any things uh, avoid alcohol sedative sleep in pills do your exercises regularly if you have a blocked nose you need to unblock it with medication okay quit smoking and avoid large meals before bedtime that's also very very important then obviously gold standard if you go to the uk and places it's only cpap okay? they don't offer surgery through the nhs because cpap is given but uh it is the most effective treat delivered through the mask so it splits the oropharynx and the nasopharynx uh so it can vary the pressures can vary now this means that you have to wear it every day if you don't wear it 0% success rate if you wear it it's a 100% success rate okay provided that you don't have any anatomical obstructions so that is the beauty of cpap however how practical is it for everyone to afford a cpap and wear it every night but you'd be surprised when we did see the sri lankan setting we did a study a few years ago not recently about i think about 7 uh, years ago we did uh, a survey of all our cpap users more than 80% were still using it whereas the success rate of cpap in other countries is less than 40% okay and that is the very reason why we may have to consider for other options because these are all problems of cpap see nasal congestion eye irritation prostophobia skin irritation nausea such things right so that's where some patients don't like to use it and some patients uh, just have no anatomical favorable uh, anatomy for cpap right so depending on whether they are mild moderate or severe we can go for uh, various treatment okay but however if it's moderate or severe or say not tolerating cpap then we will uh, consider the surgery but if it's mild surgery i am mild or severe for surgical Uh, outcome but if it's moderate or severe especially if they have high bmi it's definitely cpap okay right so what are the operations we do i think from your everyone's medical school days they have learned this one surgery called uppp or u triple p which i personally have never performed and it is a very uh, traumatic and uh, traumatic surgery where you remove everything in the pharynx and then obviously no osa but it has again limited uh, outcomes nowadays but nowadays uh, they have come up with newer techniques where we remove the tonsil and do more targeted therapy that is why it is important for us to identify the type of collapse in the in your soft palate and depending on your collapse there are several different types where we can uh, transpose the muscle muscles around your soft palate uh, and give very good outcomes okay uh, just an example i i know this is a little boring but uh, uh, where we remove the tonsils and the soft palate okay uh, with either pottery or cobblation and then we transpose the muscle and tie to the uh, hard pellet okay and then suture it not going to details okay. so there we have something known as relocation pharyngeal plastic which i personally practice a lot and uh, it has gives us very good results especially if the patient has um, an a lateral collapse and these are some newer techniques where people have come up with more temporary measures of barb pharyngoplasty and more uh, simpler anterior palatoplasty 
ST, which is which can be even done as a, done as an OPD procedure, okay, and local. So that's the beauty of it. And apart from that, it, obviously, if there's any hard hard palate or hard palate issues, we can excise the hard palate and do certain uh, advancement procedures. We can do tongue procedures from simple tongue channeling with uh, coblation or radio frequency to the more advanced transverter robotics, which we don't do here. So this is something which we commonly do, coblation, channeling of the tongue, very easy to see. Okay. Uh, we can do higher suspension as well. All these are to, if you can just see, these are all to increase the that soft tissue space in the oropharynx. Okay. Big bad names, but it's just basically the same thing to increase the space and to prevent the tongue from falling back or prevent the pharynx, uh, the uvula and uh, falling back. So the gold standard surgery is actually maxillomandibular advancement, especially than the Asians. Okay. However, as you can see, this is a and Sometimes we may have to end up with tracheostomy when there's no other option, especially obese patients. I've had only one patient in my entire career where we had to do the 180 kilogram lady at the NHSL where we had to do a tracheostomy for OSA. So then comes something known as upper airway resistance syndrome. This is something interesting because now probably you all might be able to relate to this a little more. We, we particularly see in our Asian communities thin females, okay, even males, they have long necks, high potency, okay. They don't have any other high risk, no diabetes, nothing, but they are snoring, okay. They have normal oxygen, but they are heavily snorers. So these are a very unique group of people because unlike the OSA people who are short, fat, and you know they have fat necks, their collar sizes are very big. These people are totally a different uh, category, but they are psychologically affected. They uh, they find it difficult to move along with their peer groups because of snoring, and that is you know, sometimes due to upper airway resistance in bones. So it's not obstructive. But there is snoring, and that's where surgically we can help them to a certain extent. Okay. Um, so again, just a few things. As I told you, we have to see any problems in the nose, the larynx, or the oral cavity, especially elongated uvula, tonsillar hypertrophies, septal deviations again come to play. Okay. So why do why do we do <laughs> surgery? There are a few studies, recent studies, showing that actually the risk of diabetes in patients with sleep apnea, okay, surgery versus CPAP, and uh, actually surgery is better. Okay. Um, and with the recent events where we tailor the surgical interventions to treat the specific obstructive sleep apnea, that has improved the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea markedly compared to CPAP because the CPAP failures are very high. People don't use it. They feel uncomfortable. So when we offer them surgeries, those days it was only a UP3, which was equivalent to CPAP. It doesn't work in everyone. But now if we tailor the particular surgery to the particular patients, they actually do benefit. Okay. Um, so what do we do? This is what we practice. Uh, we if they're referred, it is a multidisciplinary team. So generally, patients generally present to either ENT or respiratory medicine, but it comes from the medical clinics as well. OMF surgeons are involved. Medical team is involved for the diabetes, high blood, hypertension, and all those aspects. Nutritionists are very important because we need to get them to get thinner. Sometimes obese patients, we need to refer for bariatric surgery. And psychiatry is very, very, very important. Okay. So when they come to us, we take a detailed history, 
an examination. We do an endoscopy and do the Miller's maneuver. Then the uh, uh, units have, uh, but in my So the other places we have to send to the, uh, uh, after the sleep study is available, we uh, check, obviously, according to the BMI and everything. If the patient is fit for surgery, we do a sleep endoscopy, okay? And then we look at the level of obstruction, and then we always tell them to go for a trial of CPAP, even if they're surgically favorable. Why? Legally, CPAP, PEP is the gold standard. It has a 100% success rate. So there are private companies which do offer this service, giving a try for a few days, okay? Because it's a big amount of money they have to spend. So if they're not happy with it, uh, in our setup, we can't justify them to go and tell them to buy. So uh, they do offer this CPAP trials. Some of the government hospitals also uh, offer this uh, thing. I think at NHSL, Kalibo, and a uh, few other hospitals also have the facility to try the trial of CPAP with the respiratory conditions. Uh, and if CPAP, if the patient comes and tells, no, sir, we don't want that, then we see for surgery. Because is, is surgery offered to everyone? Absolutely not. If their BMI is over 40, Definitely no surgery for them. Okay, even if they are below forty, they have to bring down their BMI a lot because surgery would be better than the patient is uh, the BMI is low, right? And so, if the BMI is forty, we don't only it's only CPAP and weight reduction, and it required bariatric surgery. Okay, and uh, our surgical decision is always based on the drug induced. Uh, uh, sleep endoscopy, and then we may perform either a single level surgery or multi level surgery. So, in our experience, in at least the government sector, is if you operate the nose, tell them to come in two months' time to operate the throat, none of them will turn up because of the pain. Okay, so uh, this is accepted worldwide that now we do multi-level surgeries at the same setting and put the patient to ICU for post-op monitoring, okay? It is quite painful. That is the problem. Uh, these surgeries are not the easiest, okay? But once recovered, they do very well, provided that they do not put on weight, okay? So these are some international uh, protocols which are developed. Uh, so our take-home message is, know what are the causes and effects of OSA, and that they are multifactorial. Negligence can lead to serious consequences. I think I cannot stress more than that. We do a sleep study and a drug dice to diagnose the level. Uh, so I would like to thank my teachers and, and uh, Dr. Agrawal and um, Dr. Srinivas Kishore, who uh, actually trained me in uh, this uh, sleep related surgeries. So I would like, I hope you all got the gist of what is OSA and what as an ENT specialist, what we can offer to these patients. And I hope to take a few questions if that is okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much sir, for your very valuable lecture. I think this is obstructive sleep apnea. It's a very overlooked phenomena in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. And I think we got a very in-depth knowledge about the consequences if we uh, continue to ignore obstructive sleep apnea. So I think we have one question in uh, one question in the chat box. Uh, what is the yes. definitive treat treatment for upper airway uh, resistance syndrome? Yes. Okay. Let me see that. Let me try and get up the slide again. So I have been doing this lecture. Because uh, when the delivery is to the, the audience, I'm sure most of us would have some element of this. Okay. So this is the uh, slide I wanted to show. So how what can we definitely treat with? We have, before definitely treating, we have to evaluate where is the obstruction and its 
most of the time uh, uh, static obstruction okay either it's a polyp or hypertrophy turbinate the septum or tonsils okay sometimes it is the palate which is uh, either long uvula or a small surgery you can uh, correct it and patients do very well uh, post surgery in our uh, experience they do very well and they are generally healthy young lean pe people not fat and most of them are you know corporate workers okay because they are the people they work late in the night young people university going uh, people and they find it very difficult to stay with their uh, roommates or peers so they are yes i hope that answers the question so the definitive management is by identifying and then treating that specific cause so thank you sir for that answer i think uh, there's another question uh, where are the places uh, sleep studies are done said by uh, samanthi yes so good question i think uh, Uh, now it is of course many major hospitals do colombo and nhsl the ent department initially had but now i think it is I'm not sure of the current status but uh, uh, the respiratory uh, physicians also now have a sleep study so they conduct it Uh, Anuradhapura has it. Also had a machine, unfortunately, the ENT machine at uh, Anuradhapura Row. Uh, Candy has it. Mm. Kalubovil has it. I'm not sure of the other places at the moment. And maybe it is there, but I I I, I can't tell you offhand. But these four places I know I mean, for sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think uh, that wraps up the uh, today's session. Uh, and i uh, thank uh, dr bimanta perera okay, uh, for his very much time for this uh, very valuable lecture thank you sir and i thank all the attendees uh, for joining uh, joining with us today uh, on the 31st of uh, december for our lecture and i hope you will continue to join in our lectures in the oncoming uh, weekly sunday webinar series i think the link is posted in the chat box for you to obtain the e certificate uh, kindly go through it and uh, obtain your cpd points and the e certificate Thank you very much. I hope you have a pleasant Sunday and I wish all of you a very happy new year. Thank you. Thank you.